Um, okay. Uh, many thanks to the Fast Forward team for facilitating and enabling this event after three, four years. Um, <laughs> and I hope to go to Georgia at some point, because I also <laughs> would love to go to Georgia. Um, I'm going to <coughs> talk about um, a project, Quarries of Wandering Form, which combines photography, text and moving image to excavate the quarries in the occupied Palestinian territories of the West Bank. The work unearths the environmental, economic, geological and political aspects of the quarries, where a complex set of relationships between worker, owner, land, military, nationalist identities and sovereign state can be located. Um, so this is just a couple of installation views. Um, so um, Quarries of Wandering Form is actually composed of uh, a single screen, um, one hour film called White Oil, um, uh, composed of durational images and sound, and also um, photographs, um, which I'll come to kind of later. So this is an installation view from an exhibition in Bergen, um, Norway, a few years ago. Um, and these are the photographs, Widow. So I'm briefly going to contextualise how the research came about. Um, my, my, my research initiated actually as part of a PhD at the University of Creative Arts. Um, and in 2009, um, I was introduced by Howard Cagle to a set of images that France Kafka, we think, had taken or commissioned in 2011 in former Czechoslovakia as part of his research as an employer of an insurance company to the accidents that occurred in quarries. So like everyone, Kafka had to earn a living, and so he earned his <laughs> living working as an insurance broker. But he subsequently wrote about the images as landscapes of ruin and devastation. It was kind of rumoured that these images um, were actually um, uh, now in private collections in Jerusalem, as Kafka's estate, sorry, um, sorry, as Kafka's estate had been taken to Palestine in 1939 by Max Brode when Kafka passed away. And there's a whole a very interesting story about that and a court case that um, then continued between Germany and Israel about who, who has ownership of Kafka's archives, who claims them, who claims him. So um, um, my project initially started by actually thinking that I wanted to chase these photographs um, try to find them and I started to put up images within the landscape of mainly Jerusalem. I knew that I probably wouldn't find them but I wanted them to act as like a kind of protagonist in a novel in which I might encounter the landscape and think about how we could reframe and think these images within the social political landscape of, um, of um, today in the region. But actually what kind of happened was I was also at the time um, teaching at the International Academy of Art Palestine because I had done a previous body of work um, within, within this narrow strip of land. A couple of films are going to be shown later on in the screenings. And actually, I should just say, my very first trip to the West Bank was with Janan because as a, as a Jewish... Art, well, I'm, I'm an artist, but I'm also Jewish and I won't talk about my family history right now because I want to focus on this project. But um, I was very keen in the 2000s to, I wanted to visit the occupied Palestinian territories, but I wanted to go within the context. And Janan actually had a residence at the Al Manal Foundation, and so she invited me strategically um, as her cinematographer. So I <laughs> went along and we had this really quite uh, adventurous road trip, which was only a few years after the um, Second Intifada. 2004. 2004, yeah. Um, and I, I, I had been to the region in different guises previously, um, which I, I won't kind of go into any detail of. So Palestine has been an enduring focus of my work for many years and emerged from over three decades of visiting the region as an artist, activist and educator. From 2008, as I mentioned, I was a uh, visiting lecturer at the International Academy of Art Palestine. And during this period, I initiated a number of exchange programmes between the Academy and, and several universities in the UK. Um, staff and students at the Academy were instrumental in supporting this, this research. And this, sorry, let's just move on from these images. Um, from this, from uh, the, the, the making of Quarries of Wandering um, Stone, from, from Quarries of Wandering Fall. <coughs> um, and also um, uh, the Shashat Ramallah walking group that I would join every Friday morning 
to walk in the West Bank because walking in groups is a necessity in the West Bank due to the ongoing violence of Israeli settlers. So um, there was always really fascinating people on the walks. You heard, you know, kind of various academics. Um, Raja, who, um, Dana, we walk together, um, often on those walks. So, you know, I, I, I was kind of surrounded by extraordinary people who really helped me really understand quite profoundly, you know, kind of issues of state within this landscape. And this all merged over a period of probably about four, five, six years. So um, I just want to kind of say my, um, my research into the quarries draws on local and consensual knowledge. Um, as well as situating my research within collective interaction. Essentially, the making of the film was but also the participation of quarry workers, owners, and security guards, um, where my role as artist, filmmaker, activist, and ethnic ethnographer comes under scrutiny. And one of the main kind of protagonists in the film is a character called Ramsey, who is a security guard at one of the quarries in Ramallah, who I would visit when I was there most days and we would just talk and he was really taught me a lot about you know the history of the quarries but it was a really interesting relationship because I didn't tell him I was Jewish until probably the second or third meeting and he was quite um, impacted by that in, in quite a difficult way because he'd actually never met a Jew he'd never seen anybody who you know was Jewish that wasn't wearing you know a kind of military uniform and it was a very emotional moment, but we bo actually built this extraordinary relationship, and I continued to meet him for four or five years. You know, we found that our politics were very similar, essentially a socialist, sort of anti-capitalist. So, um, <coughs> um, I'll just move on to some of the images. So this is um, one of the images, uh, this is some of the, ph the photographs, Widow. Um, so... Um, so Whitehall is a long form, single screen, form, uh, single screen film and a two and, th two and three screen installation that evolves the narratives around colonialism, expropriation of land and mobility through the day-to-day -day lives of the quarry owners, workers and security guards. Moving from day to night, the film documents the industrial <coughs> process of material extraction, the changing landscape and conditions of the quarries and moments in the personal lives of quarry owners, workers and security guards to bring to bear the myriad losses of land, economy, identity, history, and community. In Widow, photographs of olive trees make visible the effects of the quarries on the surrounding landscape and symbolize a region that has been suffocated by the occupation, yet also resists and endures the violence in this landscape. Filmed in a number of locations in the West Bank, the images in Whitehall are highly composed and imbued in the language of the static frame, the duration image, and the aesthetics of delay. And I'm, one of my uh, big influences is Kurosami um, and The Taste of Cherries. Um, day scenes focus on the decimation of the landscape, machines and non-human elements, settlements and landscapes, sounds of industry and cutting of the stone. <coughs> the night scenes, in contrast, are more narrative and intimate, focusing on the social ga ga gatherings with the Al Shahada brothers and their associates who rent land to excavate the stone from a small quarry in Bezit on the outskirts of Ramallah. <coughs> the brothers are from Hebron in the south of the West Bank and would spend five nights a week camping out in a metal shipping container in the quarry as their journey home for Bezit to Hebron through Jerusalem takes four times longer, nearly three hours as a result of the checkpoints and separation apartheid war. As I mentioned, Ramsey, as I mentioned earlier, security guard and a generation older, appears intermittently throughout the film and provides a narration and consistency. He spends five nights a week sleeping in a porter ca cabin overlooking the quarry at Rafat on the outskirts of Ramallah before going to his day job as a plumber for the municipality. Um, so these are the brothers. And actually, um, one of my students, Khaled Jarrah, who's actually got his, a film screening in the Palestine Film Festival this week, actually, in London, he was really... Um, I don't speak Arabic, so he was my translator. And he's from Janine, and he, him and I, we would hang out with these guys sort of over a number of nights. We'd, we'd bring food, we'd cook, and that's actually how the kind of narrative of occupation and their experience of living in the quarries kind of emerged. 
Um, I'm often, um, I haven't kind of mentioned this, but I'm often referred to as the foreigner or she. And um, even though they're very warm towards me, they're very aware that I'm their kind of, you know, I am, I am prism through which, the, you know, the, the rest of the world, the West, they will be perceived. And they really perform and play for that in really <coughs> interesting ways. So, and this is Ramsey. Um, um, can we show the first clip? I'm just going to show how long have I got left because okay. I'm terrible at timing these things. Um, You're halfway. Okay, so we just show maybe a kind of first minute. Is <coughs> 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 the sound off? Yeah. yeah. Today there are over 350 quarries in the occupied Palestinian territories of the West Bank. <laughs> yeah. The saffron coloured limestone excavated is termed the white oil of Palestine and the only raw material available to support the Palestinian economy, providing a livelihood for over 20,000 workers. However, of the stone and sand excavated from the quarries, over 65% is expropriated by Israel for the construction industry and to build the illegal settlements in the West Bank, with Israel also exporting the stone internationally and claiming it as their own product. Almost every hillside in the West Bank is scarred by the brutal incisions of the quarries. The land pillaged and defaced, its wound left open to reveal a geology of disaster. To understand how coring has become such an intrinsic part of Palestinian livelihood, we need to unfold the narrative around Israel's appetite for the stone and the underlying ideologies at work. Collective memory has been an essential objective in Israeli, Israeli national state building. Archaeology, architecture, history and education have been key players in activating collective memory towards retrieval of the past and creation of the future. While archaeologists have sought Jewish history below the ground, architects have worked on the ground to define Israeliness, Israeliness as a local native culture that has been taken over by the Palestinian latecomer. Bound to the history and visual vernacular of occupation through bylaws in Jerusalem that require the use of stone cladding, and I should mention these bylaws were first put in place by the British, mandate, British during the mandate years in, uh, in around 19, 1917, and Israel has actually then continued those bylaws and extended them. The stone is used as a conveyor of emotional messages around notions of a sacred city and a homeland, and a way of naturalising construction projects in Israel and, and the settlements. As E. L. Wiseman writes in his book Hollow Land, in sales brochures, the yellow hued limestone is portrayed as a precious stone carved from the holy mountains of Jerusalem when in fact it comes from the West Bank. Following the occupation of the West Bank in 1967, the bylaws that I mentioned that were put in place initially by the British were extended beyond the Green Line into the West Bank with the stone used as a unifying material and a way of designing strategic military outposts, the origins of settlements that we see today. So, I mean, most of you, I think, know that. I mean, the West Bank is, is, is very small. It's approximately the size of Wales. 
It has over now, today it has over 700,000 settlers living in 279 settlements across the West Bank and, and Jerusalem. So in the last 10 years, it's, 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 um, it's almost doubled. Um, the West Bank is also, um, it's a map that I've got. So th the West Bank is divided into three areas known as um, area A, B and C, and these different zones impact on the degree to which Palestinians' lives are oppressed and regulated and the extent to which they're able to engage with and use space in the West Bank. Area A, include, which includes Palestinian cities, is under military and civil control of the Palestinian Authority, is approximately 17% of the total area of the West Bank. Area B contains the vast majority of Palestinian towns and is administered by the Palestinian Authority, but controlled by the Israeli military, approximately 20% of the total area of the land. And Area C, um, uh, um, which is the grey area, is under both military and administered control by Israel and is approximately 63% of the total area of the West Bank. And many of the quarries, you know, they kind of form within these areas. And, and what, you, what we find is that, uh, you know, for pa Palestinians, if they want to kind of build uh, a school, um, extend their homes, a playground, permits are, are often denied. But if you want to excavate and quarry for the land, permits are given because Israel has obviously a kind of investment in this material as a raw resource, which under the Geneva Convention, um, you know, um, you're, not a, you're not supposed to exploit the raw resources of an occupied territory. Um, so I'm going to just kind of, that's some of the kind of context. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the kind of work. So many of the quarries fall within areas seen are permitted by Israel, but poorly regulated. They're often located in close proximity to residential areas. So you can see the proximity to this village, and actually there's a settlement. So this, 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 this small um, village town is basically buffered between a quarry, which can, kind of gives, up, gives off huge kind of amounts of particles and dust, and asthma has become a very serious issue for um, local people. Um, and also destroying the, the carefully balanced ecology and biodiversity of the West Bank, as well as um, damaging the little agricultural land that, that there is. Um, I'm going to say, talk a little bit about, uh, if I've got time, about how some of the images are two minutes on my god, I'm way <laughs> Okay, so the relationship between the still and moving image has always been a key act, aspect of my practice, where the precision of photography is employed alongside tenses, slowness, to reduce the subjectiveness of the image and create distanciation. In white or highly composed images draw out scale, border, movement, space and time in the quarries and in the occupied territories. So I'll just go through some of the images and I'll just kind of move. Um, and I, I suppose one of the things that's kind of, um, kind of really kind of important is obviously as, as, as I am composing these images, as the kind of make and kind of, you know, how we see is what we see, um, my history also comes to bear. And so it's kind of interesting, I kind of wrote quite a bit about um, a particular set of images, which for other people, maybe, you know, it's not something they would associate with. But um, um, I'm just going to, here are just some of these. Um, is this, so... Here an image of a cobbled together stone cutting factory perched on the top of a hill with a view of the West Bank followed by an image of a settlement expose and read each other. The play of shadow and light illuminates the wall of the building in the first image and also frames a view of the West Bank and settlement through constructivist lines. In the foreground, cut stone is stacked in piles, evoking a landscape that is gradually being dismantled, a premonition of what lies ahead as well as what is actually happening in the here and now. The constructive lines resemble modernist constructive architecture and can be read as a semblance of Daniel Liebeschen's Jewish Museum in Berlin. His architecture has come to represent both the physical and psychological architecture of Jewish history, housing the memory and trauma of the Jewish people's persecution, incineration and displacement. However, here the architecture of these histories and memories, memories impose themselves violently onto the landscape, literally cutting out Cutting out the landscape and another people's history are unable to incorporate the multiple histories and narratives of this region unless it conforms to Zionist ideology. The following image of a settlement with its unified houses and red pitched roofs constructed as part of the Jewish agency plans is meant to set apart the Jewish settlements in the territories from Palestinian houses by seizing locality. 
In the 1980s, the ministry recommended that settlements councils impose the construction of red tile roofs as part of the settlement planning bylaw. It becomes a way of distinguishing us from them, says Wiseman, so that settlers can orient themselves within the landscape as well as serving as a security function, as the red roofs can be determined from afar. In white oil, abstraction delineates scale borders and boundaries of really the precarious of the landscape and viewing the images of the politics. This occurs in the framing of the landscapes of people employed to register the scale of the quarries, its borders, transitions, and proximity to, res to residential areas. Framing is often very tight with the landscape leaking in and out of shot as a way of describing a peripheral landscape like the green of the grass, the flowers, and the olives that are soon to be eaten up by the grinding and satiable appetite of the quarry machines. The evacuated spaces of the quarry seem to look back at us, asking us to recognise the enormity of the cavernous space and lines of geological force. They also ask us to recognise the borders and walls that separate us from them and the screen of the film which acts as another divide between one place and another. The quarry is a wandering form, which is the kind of body of work, um, particularly white oil, um, it, it tends to make visible not only darkness and domination, past and present, but also the minor voices of a people living in a state of exclusion. The voices of Ramsey and the brothers are the everyday struggles and interpersonal dynamics that demand an in-depth listening. They are the forgotten or missing people that speak with an alternative universe of references and provide a counter-narrative to the dominant and Israeli narrative because a whole other story is vibrating in it. 